evocative, haunting and prophetic. It's the sound that has become characteristic of 1970s rock music and one that has encapsulated the musical life of its composer. The music is of course the opening theme for Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells, a record that consistently appears in Britain's top 50 greatest selling albums and was one of the first of many releases that would launch Virgin Records into its multi-corporation success. It was off the back of Tubular Bells that Mike Oldfield, then still a teenager, was thrust into a world of fame and fortune, which for years he struggled to cope with. Oldfield has received recognition from his work as a multi-instrumentalist, a guitarist, a studio producer and a computer game designer. But it is his sensitivity towards the human condition as a composer that has drawn a cult following worldwide. Here we examine his life and work. For all the angst and tribulation surrounding Mike Oldfield's music, he was actually born into quite ordinary middle-class surroundings in 1953. His father was a doctor operating a small practice in the local Reading area and was supported by Oldfield's mother. Even from an early age, Oldfield felt to be different from the crowd, preferring his own entertainment and company than seeking popularity and being more emotionally sensitive to the world around him. His naturally reclusive nature led him towards the solitary study of music in his bedroom. Like many young boys growing up in the early part of the 1960s, Mike Oldfield listened to the British guitar bands like The Shadows and The Searchers, but really he identified more with the British finger-picking guitar style of Davy Graham and Birch Yanch and John Renborn, and would spend hours listening to and reproducing the complex finger positions he had heard on their records. As such, Oldfield learned the guitar as a completely self-contained instrument, capable of playing melodies and bass lines and interweaving middle parts simultaneously, offering the creativity and flexibility beyond merely strumming along to a vocal line. Since Oldfield received no formal musical training, the decision to learn the craft in this particular way had important bearings upon the way he learnt as a composer. Without having the need to read music to play the guitar, Oldfield developed a strong ear for music, being able to hear individual layers of musical texture and laying down the foundation for spontaneous improvisation. At this time in the early 1960s, there was a surge of interest in British folk music amongst young people. University bars and folk clubs became hotspots for music making, and the attraction of musicians like Anne Briggs, Martin Carthy and the Watersons was strong enough to entice people like Bob Dylan and Paul Simon from America. It's difficult for many of us now to understand just how much of an important contribution British folk and acoustic music has had on British rock music. Our attention always seems to focus upon the big blockbuster acts of the 60s and 70s, the Who's, the Led Zeppelins, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, but even by the mid-1950s, many esteemed black musicians like Big Bill Brunsey and Brownie McGee found a more accepting and appreciative audience in Britain than in their own still segregated America. Honestly, sage, Rosemary, 
Not only did the exposure to acoustic blues stimulate an interest in roots music, it encouraged young Britons to investigate their own traditional music too and develop a finger-picking guitar style which would complement the melodic phrases of British folk song. By the late 1950s, the number of folk clubs swelled across England and would hold performances of American and British folk music, skiffle and blues. It was this grooming environment that Mike Oldfield gathered a taste for performance and made his first steps towards becoming a professional session player. It was at the age of 12 years old that the precocious Oldfield was offered a residency at the Reading Folk Club, giving him a paid slot every week in addition to performing at other venues in the Reading area. And to thrash it all out with a bunch of hammers And then she'll be a true love of mine By the age of 15, Oldfield had left school, deciding upon a career in music he teamed up with his sister to form a folk duet called Sally Andrew, who were then signed to Transatlantic Records and released one album called Children of the Sun. The recording show an astonishing degree of talent and musical dexterity, but it was clear that his sister overshadowed his presence on stage. Oldfield wanted out. The year was 1969 and the musical climate within London was already changing. The Beatles had covered new grounds with the album Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, raising the status of recorded music as the operative mode of communication for the counterculture. Bands like King Crimson, The Nice and Deep Purple drew upon classical and jazz music pools and had shown that rock music could also be sophisticated. There was a genuine belief amongst sections of society that rock music could be much more than hit singles and teenage romance, but could also be musically challenging and lyrically profound. Here is Robert Wyatt of Soft Machine fame, speaking in 1969. Everyone laughs because this kind of remark sounds pretentious, but I, I really think it's true to say that the, it's an idiom which is which really matters, which is, uh, which is being used by some of the, you know, the most interesting creative people around, you know, I really do. And, uh, but it's constant attempt, even within the industry, it's as much as anywhere else, people who remember, like to remember it as something which wasn't very demanding and, and keep trying to put down you know, new groups or the kids who take it too seriously. I think uh, making a big mistake and underestimating just how much the kids are getting from rock music and are putting into it. Like many of the Canterbury progressive bands, ex-soft machine bassist Kevin Ayers set out to write music that pushed against preconceived ideals of popular music. Ayers' choice of abstract songwriting derived from no single source. Irregular time signatures, quirky lyrics, and unusual chord progressions were the norm, usually with a good dose of weirdness thrown in for good measure. Newly settled in London and exhausted from dragging a bass amplifier through London's tube network, Mike Oldfield, still young at 16, auditioned for the position of bassist for Kevin Ayers' group, which also included jazz saxophonist Lowell Coxhill and esteemed composer and student of Luigi Nono, David Bedford.
It is without question that the musical paternalism of the older David Bedford, keyboard player of Kevin Ayers' group, led towards the way in which Oldfield crafted his own large-scale musical ideas. Bedford, who'd already had a commission for the prompt concerts, introduced Oldfield to scoring for multiple instruments, avant-garde classical composition, and also recommended pieces of classical music for study. It was particularly Sibelius' fifth symphony that made a big impression on Oldfield. Sibelius' use of repeating themes on different instruments and in different textures, his penchant for big melodies and epic climaxes, and the offsetting of melodies at different speeds and keys were all techniques which Oldfield would apply to his own works. (laughs) 